Well, just again, to go back to your very useful, let's frame this up. There's a lot to be optimistic about globally. There really is. I mean, the longevity, the tackling, I, I have a farm background, rural research uh, and so forth. The progress we've made in feeding people, long way to yeah, go, but it's been right. incredible. We now have more obese people than we do undernourished, yeah. Yeah. which is an issue in itself. Yeah. Um, and again, even in the West, there's, there's so, the, much to be positive about, much to be done if people feel them as challenges to be overcome rather than to be overcome by. That's right. This is a Western problem. In, in Muggeridge's famous words, we're in danger of eating ourselves out from within. Yeah. Um, and we want to try and f find positive solutions. So to come back to, again, I'm going to plug it again, I'm going to say, I think it'd be terrific if every parent and intending parent, and probably their children as well, were to read this highly accessible book. I'd love to explore your, what do you call, three terrible ideas. And to read from the flyleaf, because it's a very well-written flyleaf as well, um, you say that the new problems on campus, well, let's say young people, uh, have their origins in three terrible ideas that have become increasingly woven into American, and we could add Western, really, yes, childhood and education. Yes. Firstly, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker, and people will immediately remember the old saying used to be, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, but you're saying this is one terrible idea. Mm -hmm. Always trust your feelings, which is a mantra everywhere at the moment, and life is a battle between good people and evil people. These three great untruths contradict basic psychological principles about well-being and ancient wisdom from many cultures. So that's a great start. Can we explore this idea of what doesn't kill you makes you weaker mm -hmm. and the notion of anti-fragile? You tell a yeah. fascinating story here about peanuts. Yes. This is the key idea in the book. If you don't get this idea, you won't understand what's going wrong. And if you get it, everything else seems easy and obvious. So uh, the central idea of the book, is, it comes from Nassim Taleb, uh, the guy who wrote The Black Swan. He, uh, he was trying to understand there are certain systems that, um, that benefit from shock and disorder and challenge yep. and failure. Um, he, he is one of the few people who correctly called the financial crisis. He could see that our banking system had not been tested so that if anything went wrong, it was all going down. Yeah. And so he's thinking about this after the financial crisis. What is the word for systems that actually need to be tested and challenged? And he comes up with the word anti-fragile because there is no word in the English language. We use the word resilient. If you ask people, say, oh, well, that's resilience. No, as he points out, um, uh, if something is fragile, it, it's gonna break if you drop it, so you have to protect it. Something that's resilient won't break, but it doesn't get better. So a plastic cup, if you drop it on the floor, doesn't break, it's resilient, but it doesn't get better from being dropped. And he mm. wants to know, what's the word for systems that have to be dropped? Now that might sound weird to your, to your viewers, but think of the immune system. That's yeah. the best example. The immune system uh, is a miracle of evolutionary engineering. It created an open system that learns about the environment, what toxins and bacteria, what threats are in the environment, and then it develops antibodies to that. If you protect your kid's immune system, if you use a lot of bacterial wipes, if you were to raise your kid in a bubble, like, oh, I don't want my kid to get sick, I wanna protect my child. Since the immune system is anti-fragile, that would make the child fragile yeah. because the child would fail to develop normal uh, responses. And so uh, we opened the book with the story when, when my son Max was going into preschool, we had to go for parents orientation night and the teachers are going through the rules and they wouldn't stop talking about food issues, nuts, don't bring any peanuts, don't bring any other nuts, don't bring anything that was ever uh, you know, in a factory with nuts, don't bring anything that has the letter P in it, practically. I mean, they were insane with the anti-peanut rules. Like, what? You know, what's going on here? And as I looked into it, what we learned is that rates of peanut allergies are indeed rising, we know that, but only in countries where the medical authorities tell pregnant women, don't eat peanuts. And right there, you see the clue. So a study was done uh, by some doctors who realized that this, it looks like we're actually, our advice is backfiring. They randomly assigned about 600 women uh, who had recently given birth, who had kids who were at high, elevated risk of a peanut allergy. Half of them were assigned standard advice, no peanuts. And half of them were given bags of this Israeli snack food. It's a puffed corn with a bit of peanut powder on it. it tastes like peanut butter a little bit. Give it to your three month old. Three months old love the little things that they can dissolve in their mouths. Give them peanut powder. And guess what? Five years later, when they, they followed up on everyone, they, they looked out to make sure everyone was safe. 
five years later when they tested them, it was, I think, 17% of the kids who followed standard advice had a peanut allergy for life. They're going to have to worry every meal they eat. The kids who were exposed to peanut dust, 3%. In other words, we could nearly wipe out peanut allergies by doing the opposite of what we've been doing. And our argument in the book is it's the exact same thing with kids develop more generally. We have been massively protecting kids from bad experiences. No teasing. If, if someone teases a kid in school, that's bullying now. You can't tease someone in school. Uh, we want to protect them from bad feelings. We want to protect their self-esteem. We don't want them to get hurt. We don't want them to take any risks. We think we're helping them. It's just like keeping them safe from peanuts. We're weakening them. And so uh, our argument in the book is that there are two main reasons for the explosion of depression and anxiety. Number one is social media. We'll, we'll get to that because that yeah. takes a lot of discussion. But the other is the massive overprotection that we began in the 1990s. When I speak about the book, I always ask, at what age were you allowed out? At what age were you allowed out without any adult supervision? And wherever I go, I did it la last night here in Sydney. And people are like, you know, someone says eight. Oh, eight, I was out at six. Oh, we would play till the cows came home. Oh, it was great. You know, everyone talks about how they were out playing with their friends until the 1990s, at least in America. I think you actually you're doing the same thing here. Um, we just stopped that. We felt, oh, if you let your kid out, they'll be abducted. Oh, if you let your kid out and they try to cross the street, they'll be hit by a car. We can't let kids cross streets uh, until they're 10 or 12. And so when we don't give kids the chance to develop normal human defenses, toughness, ability to be teased, ability to tease back, when we deny them all that, we're not helping them. We're harming their development. That's what we think happened. A bunch of issues to explore in there. New York, of course, is probably safer now than it was when you were growing up. It's just, the crime rate in New York is back down to what it was when my parents were young in the 1930s. Mm. Very, very little crime. And mm. then, of course, you know, everything else is safer. The, mm. you know, f less likelihood of bricks falling off buildings, fewer cars going out of control, less alcoholism. Mm. So, yeah, life is a lot safer. Mm. But we don't trust our neighbors. Mm. We are freaked out because of the media. If, mm. someone, if a kid is harmed, we're going to hear about it on the news. So for a variety of reasons, the world gets safer and safer, mm. but we're protecting our kids more and more. And mm. the result is damage. Interestingly, exploring this idea of a bit of gentle teasing along the way being part of the package. Uh, Australians are, are great uh, teasers, actually, traditionally. Mm -hmm. It's becoming incredibly incorrect now. That's right. You uh, have that English working class tradition, tradition yep. of teasing each other. Mm. And it's, it can be fun. Um, it, it helps. Now, it can veer into bullying. So the key thing we learned about bullying is the original definitions of bullying like in the 1980s required that it be over across time. Mm. So if there's one kid harassing another, humiliating him day after day, that can lead the victim to not want to go to school. Mm. It is important to crack down on true bullying. But we have what's called concept creep, invented by yes. my Australian friend Nick Haslam at yep. University of Melbourne. Bullying, the, the definition of it gets lower and lower and lower to the point where if one kid says you're stupid, that's now considered bullying. Yeah. And we, you can't protect kids from every little thing. Interestingly, your fellow American Warren Farrell's written a very interesting book called The Boy Crisis. And he actually makes the point there that gentle ribbing and part of the whole sort of uh, interaction between a father and his children can help set a kid up uh, to be able to laugh at themselves and to cope with a bit of ribbing and a few setbacks in the classroom and out in the workplace. Although he draws a distinction. He says that a child will find ribbing from mum harder to cope with. Hmm. They look to mum for support and warmth and understanding. They expect dad to stimulate them and have a little bit of a go within the bounds mm -hmm. of reason. Yeah. I haven't read the book, uh, but there are big differences in the way that boys and girls interact. Um, and some of them relate to the way they use language, and boys are more likely to tease and compete. Um, we have a problem in the United States in that as the, the mental health community, the psychology community, I'm a, I'm a psychologist, um, as it's sort of modernized and shifted and changed politically, there's been much more the idea that masculinity is in and of itself bad or toxic. Yeah. Um, so I, I think you know, the guidelines veer more towards, I think, how to raise a girl and I think boys don't quite fit into that. So I need to dig into that. I need to read Farrell's book. I need to read the new American Psychological Association guidelines uh, before I critique them too heavily. But yes, I think competition, ribbing, teasing are normal, healthy parts of boys' development. And if we protect them from this in the guise that 
that teasing is bullying, I would guess that we're harming them overall. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.